All right. Well, Nat, thanks so much for joining me on Mind Meld, man. Like, honestly, I've been following your work for so long now. It's really cool to get in a Zoom call and chat with you like face to face. This is awesome. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. So I think I just want to get started with this podcast by you kind of introducing yourself and telling your story about um, how you've got to now, essentially, your entrepreneurial journey, your uh, business journey, your content creation journey, just for the folks listening right now who may not be as familiar with you. How long of a version do you want? Uh, let's keep this mid because I want to get more into the meaty stuff. We only have an hour and a half. Let's get an uh, overview just so people can get a general understanding because there's a lot. I know that there's a lot of things you've been doing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so uh, my name is Nat. I got... So basically, I got really interested in entrepreneurship when I was in college. I was on the kind of like consulting career track, like fairly typical for like a good college and being in the like business sphere there. I uh, did a couple of consulting internships, realized it really just wasn't for me and wanted to go down the entrepreneurship like path and try to figure that out. So did a couple of things while I was in school. Towards the end of my time uh, in college, I started a blog under my personal name to start getting practice doing content marketing and like blogging is marketing. And uh, used that to get like a few initial freelance writing gigs, which actually landed me a uh, an internship with Zapier, which remains one of my like favorite companies. Uh, they have like this awesome tool for automating relationships between different web apps, and uh, I got to join their content marketing team for a semester and help out with blog and all of that, which was like incredible. Learned a ton. I uh, built my first like passive income side thing while working there, and as I graduated, and then that all led into uh, getting hired by a company here in Austin to run their marketing. For, uh, basically, like as soon as I graduated, so I got to come down to Austin, learn a ton about content marketing, email marketing, SEO, things like that, uh, and worked there for about a year. Me and the founder kind of like fell out, and then uh, I've been just doing my own thing ever since. So uh, I was traveling for a while, doing the like nomad passive income thing uh, that ended up not being super satisfying. And around the time, I was realizing that. I wasn't happy doing the digital nomad thing. A couple of companies reached out independently and asked for help on their content marketing and SEO. They were just, they'd seen me writing about it on my blog and on other sites previously. And uh, I figured like, hey, yeah, we'll try doing this on a consulting basis and see how it goes. Uh, it went okay. It was the biggest challenge was that doing like marketing as a consultant, you kind of like give them the process and everything they need to do and then they don't do it. So it would kind of like fall apart as soon as I stepped out of the system in most cases. So that was where Growth Machine, my marketing agency, came from. Was saying, okay, companies clearly want content marketing and SEO work. They don't have the resources in-house to do it themselves. So we can do it for them on kind of like a monthly retainer basis and just handle the entire process. And so uh, I started that in 2017, been running it for three years now. And uh, now we work with like, pretty big swath of clients, anyone from like bigger name companies you'd know, like Brex, Yelp, Adobe, QuickBooks, like those guys doing their content. And then a lot of like more startup-y earlier stage, uh, like Y Combinator or e-commerce businesses. Then alongside all of that, I'm still doing my site. I've been doing that for six years. It's become like a really big part of my work and how we attract clients to Growth Machine. Um, that site has been read like some 15 million times in the last six years. Um, brings in like a really solid six figure mostly passive income on its own is kind of like the passion project and interest thing uh and now i'm getting into youtube which has been like its own fun journey so uh getting back into more of the creator mode which is uh really exciting that's awesome man there's so much there and like there's so many like li little different ways we can go about uh this conversation now because there's so many questions that i have for you just based on your journey i mean the first one I think we can get into is you, you kind of did the shift from that like nomad life to like this, oh, passive income to like, you know, building out real businesses and then building out your own, um, your own platform. So maybe we can, we can kind of start with that because I think that's super interesting to me. Like, it seems like your, your mind, your mindset almost did like a 180 or was it just you trying out things like, oh, let's see if this lifestyle is for me. And then you found that for you, it wasn't as uh, satisfying. I just want to hear your philosophies on that because obviously it's changed a lot. Yeah, I think that there. You know, so, Four Hour Work Week is like the canonical book on this, right? Yeah. And it's it's still probably the best book. I don't really know that anyone has 
one up to Tim since he put that book out for how to like build a lifestyle business and be able to travel the world and just like goof off and sort of do what you want to do. But there's this sort of like last chapter in the book that I don't think anyone reads or anyone takes seriously, which is called The Void, where it's basically that once you remove the need for work, you will probably get really unhappy unless you know exactly what you're going to fill that time with. And I think that a lot of people who are pursuing and who are talking about the like digital nomad passive income life, the people who are like trying to be influencers in that space and who you see on Instagram and whatnot, they don't actually have that life because they're working so hard to prove they have it and make money off of proving they have it, that they're not actually living like that idea that they're selling, right? And they're probably actually not making very much money too. There's a reason that people live on like there's a reason people go like work and live in Thailand when it's super cheap, right? I'm sure they would prefer to live in Manhattan, but they can't afford to. Uh, because right. they're, you know, selling kind of shitty passive income courses and trying to do like bottom barrel Amazon dropshipping businesses. It's like not a good arena to be competing in. Um, most people that I know who actually hit that point where they can just not work for six to 12 months, uh, they get bored really, really quickly and feel very empty very quickly if they don't have a very clear thing to redirect that energy into. And that was the same thing I hit where uh, I was making enough money off the site and some other projects to just go live in Argentina and not work for four months and just like goof off. And I was just like really not happy. Uh, there was so many downsides to making that choice where it's like, all right, it's not something that I'm really building anymore. Uh, I don't have a community here. There's like all of these headaches with not like being in your home country and like not being as fluent in the language and, you know, banking. It's just like, there's so many things that are annoying and you're kind of like always chasing these short term, like hits of novelty, right? That's what a lot of the travel Instagram life is about is like rapid short term satisfaction and signaling. And it, it felt hollow really, really quickly. And so I was like, all right, this is not a good lifestyle. I want to go figure something else out. And that was, um, it only took like four or five months to kind of hit that feeling and then be like, all right, I want to go back and actually like work on something. And I, I didn't really know what that something was. I wanted to keep working on uh, my site right, and just keep doing more writing stuff and find a way to like scale and grow that. But it, uh, it just wasn't making enough money for that to be sustainable while living in New York uh, with my then girlfriend, now wife. And so I was like, all right, I need something that's actually going to like bring in more income in the near term. And that was kind of where Growth Machine uh, came out of. That's cool. So like creating an agency where you actually work with people, continually building stuff, building relationships, because I think like that's the thing with entrepreneurship, especially right now in this time, in this society, you know, a lot of people have this pursuit of freedom, obviously, like that's obviously one of the reasons people pursue, pursue entrepreneurship, even though, you know, you, 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 you forego the nine to five to work like 80 hour work weeks, just because you love what you do. Right. So it's really interesting to me that, you know, a lot of people are trying to do this get rich quick schemes. They're selling courses to, you know, get a lot of money real quick. Um, they're doing like, yeah, bad courses too, like <laughs> nothing like really interesting. And then they hit this wall. Exactly. Like you said, it's like, okay, now you have freedom. You don't have to work, but then what are you going to fill that, that void with? So it's really interesting to me. Like for, for me, I'm a content creator. I'm a builder. I'm an artist designer, you know? So I think you're along the same lines where it's like, clearly you have more fun doing the thing than just like building up the system and then just leaving it. And sure, it's a machine that can make you money, but you have more fun actually doing things, you know? So it's really interesting. And I think it's really cool that you're able to do that with your personal site more than anything. Because like, realistically, just with your site alone, you could probably live like a decent life. Like even like maybe not to a degree that you would like, but the amount of money that you're making just from your own personal website, I think that's so fascinating to me, man. Like, so I want to get into that because... There's a couple things we have in common here. It's your site's on Webflow, so is mine. I think there's a lot of people out there. We talked about this in another call where people think, you know, you can't rank with Webflow. There's no good SEO. Like if you want good SEO, it needs to be a WordPress site, but that's clearly not the case. And you can build your own your own hub. You can build your own place on the internet with a website and actually build um, a pretty good platform. So let's get into that. I, I really, really found your platform really interesting because how I came across your site originally was through your book notes. And 
through that, I got into your blog and then I signed up for your newsletter. And then from there, like you started like remarketing, you have all these different projects where now it's not under one niche or it's not under one thing. Like notoriously your, your, uh, your, uh, uh, newsletter is literally called Monday Medley, which is like just a medley of all these awesome things. And and obviously with me with Mind Meld, I want this podcast to be something similar. It's just about a lot of different things that I'm just interested in. It really just seems like all the content you're putting out is just the things that you're interested in and like nothing else. Like it's not just like random bullshit. It's just stuff that I can really tell that you're genuinely interested in. So I want to know how you got it started and kind of where you're thinking about it now, especially with the shift to YouTube and kind of expanding your platform. So, I mean, the site started just as a resume, right? Where it was meant to be like, okay, I can do some writing and, you know, I can send that writing to people who I want to work with and show them that, okay, yeah, I can do like content creation. I can do decent writing. Like, hey, hire me. Uh, And that was really all it started out as. I was just writing about whatever random topics I thought were interesting and made sense. And uh, that, that worked really well in the beginning for kind of like getting that initial foot in the door with some of these companies. Uh, where it started to get more interesting is I eventually wrote an article, I think like seven or eight months after I started the site, I wrote an article about uh, water fasting. And this was before fasting was like cool. And I was talking about, you know, I just heard some mention of it somewhere as like something that could be beneficial to do. And so I said, okay, cool. I'm just going to try not eating for five days and see what happens. And I wrote like a whole recap of that experience on the blog and said, Hey, you know, this is what it was like not eating for five days, whatever. Didn't get like that much interest when I published it. But then three or four months later, it started showing up on Google for keywords related to water fasting. And, you know, up until that point, when I would wake up and check the stats, the site would have gotten like 10, 20 visitors the day before. And, you know, that was cool and exciting. But then I woke up and the site had gotten like 200 visitors the day before. And it hadn't been put on Reddit or somebody hadn't tweeted about it or anything. It had just, started to rank for i think the keyword was like five day water fast and as soon as i saw that i was like oh that's kind of cool and then it stayed at 200 every day after that uh and i mean i don't think it's ever gone below 200 ever since that day right and pretty soon it started ranking higher because google liked the article and then it was getting uh like 500 and then a thousand visitors a day without me doing really any additional work And i was like well this is kind of cool so that got me more interested in seo and as I was uh, basically as I was finishing up my my role at that startup in Austin, the site was like getting even more and more popular. Where suddenly it was getting uh, five thousand, six thousand, ten thousand visitors a day. And I was like, wow, okay, this is a substantial amount of traffic. Uh, and so I figured, okay, I could probably find a way to monetize this. So I was looking at uh, affiliate stuff. Uh, I never really considered ads. I just don't like the experience of having ads on a site. It's a poor monetization strategy. But I was doing affiliate stuff. I got like a mobile app built that I was promoting through the site. And that was like bringing in a substantial amount of like passive oh, income. Man, talk about that. Because I feel like it's kind of gone under the radar now. It's an interesting app. Yeah. I, I remember. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about that app. Yeah. Yeah. This just is like before, the, this t- tangent before we go on. Yeah. For sure. This is like the, East, this is like the <laughs> Easter egg in, in my, my older work. So it is. Yeah. Uh, I, I learned SEO by talking about like sexual health and performance for men. So I had. I published an article on my site and this was the first like super viral article I ever wrote. I published an article on the site that was basically about just like how to last longer in bed for men. And <laughs> it was, but the, the goal with it was to make it very, very low bullshit, like right. very just direct, useful, none of the like macho shit. And there really wasn't an article quite like it online at the time. A lot of people have sort of like copied it now uh, and the competition has gotten a lot stronger, but I wrote it, I put it on Reddit, uh, and it just like blew up on Reddit. Like I still get DMs on Reddit from people finding it there and reaching out. And I mean, I published that four years ago now. So it went viral. I got like 50,000 some views in the span of 24 hours. And then I was like, wow, okay, that's cool. Uh, and then a month later, I published another article related to it. And that one did, I think it did even better. It got another like 50, 60,000 views. Um, and that was about like non ejaculatory orgasms for men. You can like find all this on the site, but uh, I put the link in the description well. if you guys are interested. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you can get and, right into it, go right down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then within the span of like a month and a half, I was top three on Google for all of those terms. Jeez. And 
when you're like number one on Google for how to last longer in bed, that's a lot of traffic. Uh, and so I was like, holy shit, this is like a lot of visitors. And in the article, I was linking to a Kegel app on the App Store that cost like two or three dollars, but it was targeted at women. And I was like, well, there's like, it's sort of a slightly different exercise and process for men. And there's literally no app in the App Store for doing Kegel exercises for men. So I got in touch with a developer who was actually on my newsletter list and he helped build an app. We a super basic app, but did exactly what we needed to do in the context of the article, uh, put it in the app store. And that app has made anywhere from like two to $8,000 a month every month since we put it in there still to this day years ago yes yeah, to this, this day. day wow i think it's got like 500 reviews now it's it's by wow. far the most popular and most highly rated um Eagle app for men itunes i just want to like google how it shows yeah. up here because uh oh you know what there is one that's more popular now so i i knew somebody else was like getting into it um yes yeah, so now it's like doctor yeah yeah, I mean, when I when I published it, there literally wasn't one, and I th- I think these guys are running ads and stuff, so okay, it's like, so they're going hard. Like, their app is, yeah, 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 and their app is way more, I think, like developed and intense than mine. But it's like I don't really mind because this was never yeah. meant to like be a business. It was just like no. a side thing, and it still goes to this day. That's insane to me. See, um, this is why I wanted to get into this topic because like that was just a way for you to kind of monetize that post and monetize your website and it's still making money to this day and you haven't done a thing to it. Well, I'm, I'm sure you've done something, maybe. I don't know, but no, very I, I've little. Updated it, I've updated it twice in three and a half years. Okay, so that's pretty and, good. That's pretty yeah, good. Yeah, I just brought it up. I mean, this, this tells you how little attention I pay to this. I haven't looked at it in months. It's got 980 ratings. Jeez. And it's currently number 21 in the health and fitness category on iPhone, which is like... That's really cool. Pretty cool. That's awesome. Um, and that's just a side project. That's just like one of the things that you've done in the last couple of years. That's, that's what's so amazing to me. And the other thing I find really, really amazing, um, or actually I kind of want to ask you, is just like back then when you did it, you definitely needed to hire a developer to to build that. But nowadays with no code, I feel like if you had that idea, would you try to go ahead and like prototype it or like build it yourself with a no code tool, something like Glide? I don't know if you've heard of that, but basically you can build a full mobile app from a Google sheet and embed video because it's a very simple app, right? Like you don't need to hire someone now. So if you have these ideas for like these listicle apps or like something that's just like a little bit more educational that doesn't include so much crazy functionality. You can just go ahead and build it yourself and throw it up on the app store. Like, is that something yeah, you mean, would I think do? If I, were, if I were in that position, if, if I were four years ago, Nat today, yeah. that's definitely what I would do. I mean, like my philosophy on some of this stuff has changed just because as you have like more access to resources, it makes less sense for you to do things. But mm-hmm. if I were in that position today where I'm like very short on, money and want like the easiest way to get this done possible that would be a really good solution i don't think those tools existed four years ago so no, they i didn't. needed to find somebody yeah. who could do the ios development yeah that's really cool and then also because kind of on the same topic same same sphere with the no code space at, at that time your website was on wordpress right and you had since yeah, moved correct. it to webflow so i actually want to hear a little bit about sorry my siri is you're good. Heard up something. I was trying to. I just saw text moving on my screen, and there's. <laughs> I don't know. Just shut up, Siri. Okay. Um, anyways, back on it. Yeah, with uh, with Webflow, like shifting over from WordPress to Webflow. What was your thought process on moving it over? Because I mean, for me now, it's a no brainer. I will always 100 recommend Webflow. Is that the same with you now? And like, kind of what? Just tell me a little bit about how you shifted it over and your mindset on that. Yeah, for solo sites or sites that only a couple people are going to touch, I pretty much always recommend Webflow now. The reason I moved over was I was excited about Webflow. Uh, a friend of mine, Julian Shapiro, had done a ton of their marketing work and he had you know, mentioned it to me and like how cool it was. And so I started playing around with it. And the thing that really sold me on it was just how much easier it would be to do little tweaks and adjust things and even like spin up new CMS layouts compared to what you can do in WordPress. Like WordPress is fast to get started, but it's super limiting and it's very hard to tweak your design in the ways you want it and make, you know, the changes that you, you know, would need to get it exactly how you want it. So I always found myself like fighting with my WordPress site. Uh, Webflow had more limitations back then. It doesn't really have any of those anymore, which is 
awesome. Um, yeah. I mean, when I started using it, there was no there was no like schedule posts for later. There was no custom code in the CMS. Uh, there were like a lot of things that felt really important on WordPress that were missing, but did the switch anyway. Um, and I just like it's it's a phenomenal tool because the, the analogy I make is it's kind of like uh, learning how to use Photoshop, where there's high initial energy required to like get going, but once you know how to use it, the you know what you can do with it is so much greater than what you can do with like Microsoft Paint, which is maybe mm-hmm. the the WordPress analogy. Here. <laughs> yeah, it totally um, is. Yeah. And I've just been like super happy with it. We use it for the growth machine site too. Uh, I'll use it for other like projects and one-off things. There's just like a lot of really big benefits to Webflow. Uh, And I've got like a whole article about this, about why I moved from WordPress to Webflow um, and like everything I like about it. So it's just a great tool, honestly. It makes it makes editing your website and doing stuff on your website a much more joyful experience than it fighting is. with WordPress. You the do get a literal flow. That, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The caveat I give is that when you're a business and you're working with like a lot of people, and there's there might be a bunch of freelancers like jumping in to do articles and whatnot, WordPress might be a better bet just because more people are going to be familiar with it. There's going to be less learning curve. WordPress does better with multi-user like permissions and things like that. So sometimes that's a better. Uh, for that case, but if you're like a solo blogger and you want to like build your brand, yeah, I think Webflow is a way better tool for to show sure. it with. Yeah, and then when you and like this is all just for people listening. This is coming from an SEO wizard, man. Like you're quite <laughs> honestly an expert in SEO, so we'll definitely get to some of the tools and tactics and strategies on that. Um, but with your site, how did you think about the SEO? Like, were you worried about that? How did you make sure that all your pages still ranked and and everything like that? Yeah, I was worried about it. And are you going to release the video for this? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can. You are? Is that going to go on YouTube or something? Yeah, yeah, I'll put it on YouTube. Here, I'll put you on oh. a full screen here and you can go over yeah, and do here. it. So for anyone who's curious, this is what happens when you migrate your entire site to a new uh, platform. This right here, where we were at like 10 to 12,000 visitors a day really consistently. And then this drop down to basically half of that. That's what happens when you migrate your entire site to a new platform. There's pretty much always going to be like a a short-term SEO consequence. But if you can kind of like get through that hump, it can start to go back up. So, you know, I've had some of the highest traffic periods since moving to Webflow. Um, You know, there was a period where I was getting like 20,000 visitors a day, which is crazy. Uh, But this also shows you some of the site, the cyclicity? cycles that come from like getting oh, a yes. from SEO, right? Like it goes up, goes back down, goes up, it's back down a little bit again, right? Like it's all pretty natural. But yeah, switching from Webflow cut it in half for a little while, but it came back, right? And there's, right. there's things you can do to mitigate that loss. Um, I'm still screen sharing, aren't I? Yeah. All right. Sneak peek oh, of upcoming also, YouTube videos. But. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> um, if you want to go back, what was that spike? Actually, no, back over here. Oh, yeah, What sure. was that? Yeah, you can show it again if you want. Uh, that spike recently. There's a massive spike. Yeah, like what the hell is that? You're going to laugh. Uh, somebody there. Have you ever been on Reddit Monkey's Paw? No, I haven't. I'm going to go on that so, after this, though. <laughs> it's, it's a really funny subreddit. Uh, yes, that was a spike with 60,000 visitors in one day, which is nuts. Whoa. Um, that was, uh, there's a subreddit called Monkey's Paw where you basically, somebody, the, the title of the topic will be a wish somebody makes. And then all of the comments are like the secret consequences of that wish, right? Like the fable of the monkey's paw, right? Is you get five wishes, but uh, each wish has like a hidden consequence, right? Nice. So you can also you stop like, sharing your screen now. We can get back into yeah. <laughs> cool. you, and now you wish see that. For, yeah, you can see that. <laughs> you wish for eternal life, but you're like stuck in a box, right? It's, there's always some like secret consequence to your wish that makes it non desirable. So anyway, somebody uh, somebody put a monkey's paw wish that I wish men's orgasms lasted as long as women's, and then the top comment was just a link to my article, and that you know just sixty thousand people in the course of a day, which is crazy. So. Jeez. Uh, okay, so was that, what is your most ranked article now? Is it that one still? Or is there... Like which, which article gets the most recurring traffic? Yeah. Yeah, we can just keep sharing. Yeah. Have you been looking to alternative analytics tools? Or is it you kind of just all in on it's, Google? I don't really... I mean, I honestly don't really care about the analytics for my site. It's interesting, but I'm not optimizing for anything. 
Um, yeah, so last longer bed's still the most amount of traffic, multiple orgasms, 48 laws of power, water fasting, Hegel's art of seduction, Rome, my book notes, 12 rules for life. Cool. So it's kind of like an interesting mix of things here. Right? That's cool. Let's get into um, the 48 laws because we chatted about this before. Um, I was wondering if you were going to, because like now that you're doing more YouTube, that if you were going to post videos of these book notes and stuff. And lo and behold, you did. You did the 48 laws of power. And when we, yeah, when we spoke before, you had an interesting um, view on why you did it. I did not think that was why you did it, but obviously um, you, you did it for a specific reason. So maybe you can get into that, like why you actually did that video. Yeah. Uh, so basically, and I'm, I'm just going to keep sharing my screen. And if you're, if you're on audio, it'll still make sense. Don't worry. But basically you can, so 48 laws of power is one of the most popular uh, book notes on my site. So people who are going onto Google, and so yeah, it's like the third most popular site. Somebody goes onto Google and they search uh, forty-eight laws of power summary or something like that. And as soon as they do, I pop up as like the number one result, right? So this gets a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of traffic. Um, and so what I was thinking is, okay, how do I use my existing stuff on my site to grow my YouTube channel? So because this is one of the most popular pages on my site, I made a video about this topic to kind of like share some of the top lessons from this book. Uh, and this was, I think, rather clever because there's 30,000 people a month, 30 to 40,000 people a month landing on this page. If like 10% of them watch this video, that's an extra few thousand views on my channel per month, which is you know additional subscribers, uh, all of that, which will help it rank on YouTube. Plus, by having the video on the page, I'm actually increasing dwell time on the page, which is going to help this page continue to rank highly on Google. So it's this very like virtuous cycle where the video is helping the page rank higher, the page is helping the video rank higher. Like they're all kind of feeding off each other. And we can actually go look at my YouTube analytics here, and you can see that a lot of people are watching uh, that video uh, coming from my site, which is super neat because it means it's actually working. Right? Like people are not just scrolling past it onto the blog, they're actually like uh, finding it in the article and then reading it. So you can see like 27% of all the external traffic to this wow. uh, video is just coming from my site, uh, which is really, really neat because there's no, I mean, we could go through all of my other analytics, but there's no other video that I have right now that's getting this much traffic from my site. Uh, and I think, can we split it out by, yeah, so... 14% of the traffic for it is external. And of that external, a quarter of it's coming from my site. So there's still a lot that's just coming from YouTube itself because YouTube is the main source of other YouTube traffic. But getting a lot from my site too is like really useful. Um, and I think that's part of why you can see with this one, it's got this like very steady view curve. Like a lot of other videos taper off. You can, it's, it's sort of hard right. to tell looking at it like this, but a lot of other videos kind of like taper off a bit. This one's been more steady. steadily growing. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's getting those hits every day from being on the site. So if we're looking at like all of my videos, right, it doesn't necessarily have the most views now, ones that have come out after right. it or, you know, a little before it might have more. But I think if we look at this in a year, this one will probably have more than some of these others because it's just continually getting those hits from my site. It's a really good long-term growth strategy. So it's like that, yeah, that evergreen, continually growing content. So yeah. is, does that mean one of your next videos is going to be on how to last longer in bed? Because like, we're all <laughs> waiting for it, man. <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm sort of done with those topics. I mean, it was, it was fun yeah. to do them when I did. but And I'm you know happy to have the site continue to rank for it. I still think they're really good articles and super useful. It's just like not part of what I want to focus my personal brand on. So <laughs> good call. Yeah, it's, it's evolved. You're evolving to it. So it's all yeah. good, man. Um, so what are some of the other videos that you're thinking about doing for this? Like, are they yeah, all I mean, book? Are they book related? Or are there stuff that are not actually? Um, no, I can show you the whole books, yeah. YouTube editorial calendar here. I mean, let's cool. see. so we've got these are ones we've published. We've got a couple that are already recorded um, that are coming out soon. So migrating from Evernote and Notion to Rome, those will be out soon. Uh, why somebody should start a life-changing blog. So I have this whole, I have this long article on like how to start a blog that changes your life. And so I'm turning that into a series of videos. So first one's why. The second one is like how to set up the blog. So doing all the Webflow stuff. The third one's like what to write about, promotion, monetization, like everything. So it's going to be a, a really good series, I think. Um, 
doing my book notes on the almanac of Naval Ravikant because I finished that the other day. And so figured that would be oh, a good I just got do. that. On, I'm just, I, I'm going to get into that. Like I think this weekend, it looks awesome. Eric did a really good job. I was really impressed. I was very skeptical of the quality of a book that's just like summarizing someone else's ideas on interviews and stuff, but it was fantastic. That's cool. Uh, these are ones that are definitely going to come out. So taking highlights from physical books, anti-fragile, setting up your blog I mentioned, you know, why Webflow, 30-year thinking. And then these are like just all the other random ideas I've got. Just ideas. Cool. Yeah. Favorite productivity apps, more stuff on Rome, how we sell big agency clients, shitting on Oatly. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So th- this is what's really awesome to me. So first of all, I'm super happy that you're getting into YouTube. It's a great way to kind of get to know you more for people who have like read your work. And I mean, I want to get into kind of like what your thought process on why you want to do YouTube. Cause like, you know, some people are like, Oh, he's a writer. He's a content marketer. Like he should just stick to writing. But you're like, no, I'm gonna, just going to do my thing. So I want to hear about that. But first, are you um, familiar with transmedia? Well, I mean, you're, no, you're obviously that. familiar with it, but it's a term. So I don't think a lot of people really know about this. So maybe I'll write a blog post. I'll take a, a page from your notebook and make a blog post about this and then turn it into a transmedia experience. So transmedia is this idea that you can have a multi-platform narrative and it stems from like, you know, like fiction, like, you know, there's a book, like Lord of the Rings book was turned into a movie and then it was games. And then it was like web experiences. I think one of the best, um, things that just came out recently was like Pokemon and the Pokemon go thing, you know, Pokemon was a TV show. Yeah. But it's also this experience, this game, it's this idea that you can have like a single idea and then you can experience it throughout all these multi multiple channels, multiple mediums. And I'm really starting to explore this now and how more people can do this because I think a lot more people are doing what you're doing now, which is you might write a long form blog post about it. And then from that blog post, you're going to turn that into a YouTube video and that's going to be its own type of medium, but around the same ideas. But the way you deliver the message is a little bit different. And then you could also do like, you know, a Twitter thread, you could do like email, like all these different platforms that you're on, you, you can do that. And I mean, like, that's a simple way to do it. Like the real way of doing transmedia is like with storytelling more so, but I think it can be applied to marketing and content marketing. Cause it just really seems like putting more nodes out in the network and having those nodes connect is like the way to grow. Like it just seems like also from your experience, that's the way to go. Yeah. Here, I'll show you something else too. I've been thinking about this a lot as well, and that was part of the getting into YouTube thing. So um, what I started doing in my Realm database is I collect all of my topic ideas, things that I might want to write about or do something with. And then within each topic idea, I've got like Twitter thread, LinkedIn post, blog post, YouTube video, Nat Chat episode. And then I can like organize my notes on the topic and then use those notes to create all the other media. So... This is kind of like exactly what you're talking about, which is how do I take one idea? So something like, uh, what's another good one here? Like systems mindset, right? Where this started as a Twitter thread and the Twitter thread did super well. So I said, okay, if that Twitter thread did really well, that's probably going to be a, <clears throat> a really good blog post. So I did a blog post on the systems mindset. And now what I'll probably do in a couple of weeks is make a YouTube video about the systems mindset that links back to the article because the article is within my like paid publication almanac. So the YouTube video is a great way to spread the idea to reuse some of these existing thoughts, but it's also marketing for my paid publication. So it's like a really great way to repackage the ideas. And then Rome is really great for this because you can have like, you know, all of your notes organized in one place. And then I can do something like I can open up my notes in the sidebar. And then I can start working on like the Twitter thread by pulling in pieces of this, writing my own additions to it. Um, while still leaving in the references to my notes where like those ideas came from. So this is a really cool way to extend your work into multiple mediums without having to redo a ton of stuff and by and while tracking where everything has ended up over time. That is amazing. And I love your system for setting this up. And for people like either seeing this or if you're just listening to, uh, Nat is in Rome right now, which you did a course recently, like you launched the course very recently. Um, and uh, clearly like you're, you're a wizard with Rome. And we talked about before, it's like not an either or like a lot of people like notion versus Rome, but I can already see that you're using, um, them both. And how have you been able to link the two and make them work together? Cause that's what I've been really thinking about. Cause right now, almost everything for me notes and all is all in notion just cause that's what I was yeah. used to, but I'm really, really, really interested 
in starting to use Roam for linked ideas, especially as we're talking about, you know, linking different media types and then ideas. Like there's there's so many things you can do with it. I'm just seeing the possibilities. So I'm interested to see how you think about connecting the two. Yeah, I, you know, I haven't figured out a perfect solution for this, right? I use Notion for um, the YouTube editorial calendar stuff just because it's a little more robust in templating and mm-hmm. I can actually show you. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't invent any of these templates. These are all stolen from Ali Abdal and Thomas Frank. So oh, please cool. do not give me credit for any of this. But I, whenever I add like a new idea, right, that I'm going to expand on, it's like it's got all of these fields, right? So I can talk about which content bucket it fits in. Uh, the systems mindset would probably be, you know, that would be a repurposed article, right? It's not part of a series. We can pick the editor, publish date, all of that. But then I've got this template for doing the video outline, and it takes a little bit to load because there's a lot to it. But once it does, I've got uh, all of my to dos for publishing this video. I've got call outs for the title ideas, keywords, whatnot. But then I've also got like pre-filled script type stuff that I can fill out for doing the script for it. I've got show notes with like my templated show notes materials in here. Like all of this is pre-filled, which makes doing it really, really fast once I decide to start working on something. So it's really hard to do something quite like this in Rome right now, just because it's not as robust with like templating. And the, the way I describe it, the way I describe my use of the two is Rome is for uh, maker brain and Notion is for manager brain. And Interesting. Yeah, if you haven't read Paul Graham's article, uh, Maker versus Manager, it's a phenomenal article. It's one of the mm-hmm. best productivity articles out there, I think, because it's a really important concept to understand. And so when I just need to like bang out my thoughts on a topic, then I'm going to be in Rome, like writing it out. It's because I find Rome is really conducive to that like finicky creative mind. But then when I need to like manage a process or uh, like I keep all of my SOPs between me and Amanda, like in Notion as well for like how to do a bunch of stuff. Like that's all in Notion, uh, and that just like lives better here because I think it's really good for managing info. I find Notion very hard to be creative in, but I find it excellent for like managing a bunch of stuff. So that's how I balance the two. That's awesome. So do you write all your blog posts right in Rome now? Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. They'll, they'll get like ninety percent written in Rome and then uh, transferred over to Google Docs. Like this is one I was writing this morning. It'll probably be published by the time this podcast episode comes out, which is Very sort of cool. like cool. I'll uh, link it uh, in the description. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of like about the contrast between what I call like morning net and evening net, where morning net is like. I just want to like read books and be productive and like do good work. And evening that is like, I want to drink wine and play video games. And so how do we get like evening that to listen to morning that and like creating an environment that helps reduce those impulses. So this is just but do you like, think it's okay to be able to do that and kind of relax or do you just give your ta- yourself like specific time to relax and kind of unwind? Oh yeah. No, I, I don't have anything against relaxing. Like I love relaxing. The, the main concern that that I have is just like the habitual casual drinking, right? right. It's like I'm actually it's fine more with on the drinking else. than the video. Yeah, it's games. more on the drinking side, yeah. <laughs> okay. the, the drinking or the staying up late or the ordering food instead of cooking. It's like those kinds of things uh, that yes. are uh, like it's primarily the health stuff, like the health and sleep stuff, right? Right. Because a lot of your I find that a lot of your health and your the quality of your next day is determined at the end of the previous day. So, but that's also when your like willpower and energy are the lowest. So, how do you like set yourself up for the highest chance of success in the evening when you're not going to be like super motivated the way you are in the morning? Uh, right. and that's kind of like the concept behind this piece. I'm going to lower my blinds slightly because this sun is cool. Like weird glare on my. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Those are definitely uh, electric, aren't they? Oh yeah, automated. That's awesome. Automated. Uh, I've got cool. the same one. I've got the same one in my bedroom, and it's connected to the Alexa, so it automatically goes up at seven a.m. and goes down at sunset, which is awesome. Because then you just get woken up by the sun if you're not up already by seven a.m. and you don't have to use an alarm clock, which I love. Oh, so much better, man. The alarm clocks has been uh, destroying me. I'm not a morning person. I have so much trouble uh, waking up in the morning. But what I found, what the only thing that has actually helped is I don't know if you're familiar with Mind Valley. Or have you seen Mind Valley online? Um, I know the name. 
Yeah. So I mean, it's, it's always those things you're like, I've definitely heard about it. So this book up here, I actually have four copies of it. I had 20 copies, but I've been giving them away. Um, it's from the founder of, um, of Mind Valley, Vishen Lakiani. And this book is called The Buddha and the Badass. I think I bring it up every single episode of this podcast. It is amazing. Um, but anyway, so Mind Valley is kind of like a masterclass, but for different topics and different things rather than like from, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but there's more of the spiritual side. They have some like meditation classes and stuff, but they have this really cool class. There's like sleep mastery. So that's something you might actually be interested in. Um, my girlfriend did it and she kind of taught me. I'm like, hey, I'm going to do some other courses on there. You teach me what you learn. You'll, you'll learn faster that way. So she was like teaching me about chronotypes. I don't know if you're interested or you know about chronotypes. Oh man, you're going to love this. I mean, if you're all into sleep tech, I think having the the strategy and philosophies behind sleep is so amazing. Like it was talking about like when you should drink coffee and apparently you shouldn't drink coffee for the first 90 minutes after waking up and it does nothing really for you other than feed your addiction to coffee. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to try it and not drink coffee the first 90 minutes. Worked out great. And then the chronotypes, it was like you as a type of person, it's like, what time do you naturally wake up? There's people who are like lions, their chronotypes called lions. And these are the people that are up at like 4.30 a.m. because, you know, lions hunt before the sun rises. I have a friend that goes to bed at like 11 p.m. and wakes up at like 4.30 every morning. I'm like, how the fuck do you do that, man? I'm like, I cannot do that. I just found out my chronotype is a bear or like an early bear. And I've been the guy that kind of like sleeps in or I love to sleep in. So I've known that about myself. And then the course was just saying, um, you know, if you wake up at the exact same time every morning or best, it doesn't really matter what time you go to bed as long as it's within the same time. But the biggest factor is the time that you wake up. So once you get on a good habit and routine of waking up at the same time, then your body starts automatically waking up that way. So it's, it's really interesting. You might be interested in that course or some of the philosophies there. It's really cool. Yeah, no, it, it all sounds pretty familiar. I don't buy the... Uh the the predetermined morning person versus evening person thing. I think it can like, be changed I, too. Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely heard that before. And it feels just sort of like uh it feels more enabling than yeah. uh like based in any kind of science. Right. It totally, I'm totally like, does. I'm always sketchy. I'm always very skeptical of those things whenever I hear them where it's like, oh, like some people are just genetically late risers, right? It's like, no, if somebody was genetically a late riser, their genes would have died out a very long time ago. Because they would yep. have been eaten by like fucking everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I agree. And I think you can definitely change your chronotype. I guess it's maybe for like the, you know, know thyself, like understand, oh, you can categorize yourself as a bear. Like, oh, like I'm a bear and like I want to turn into a lion if you want to wake up early. But it helps you categorize those things. I, I kind of like those for at least being able to understand yourself and being able to kind of put yourself in a bucket at least in the beginning you can always change i don't i don't uh, i agree i don't think it's like yeah. you are this and that's it i, I think everyone can change in every aspect and, and that's i like how yeah. i like how sort of every uh every like school of thought or every area of interest has like its own version of astrology right yeah. this is sort of like the this is like the high output astrology like myers briggs is kind of the the business astrology like Every uh, it's it's such a common thing. I think it's like a very and everything. Yeah, yeah. It's like a very human need to, I think, create greater meaning out of earthly things. If that makes sense, like especially since we're such a secular society now, like we're not religious in the traditional sense. We mm -hmm. find ways to make religion out of like everything else. Right. So like CrossFit comes into this as well. Or right? like CrossFit is a church uh, in many ways. And oh, I think, look like, up Mind Valley, man! Like you'll see, their their office in Manhattan was called. If I, I think that I'm going to remember this right. It was called like the um, the Church of Light or something, or like the <laughs> Temple of Light. They called it. Yeah, they called their office. Just look it up on Google. The Temple of Light, or of light. or mind, or just look up Mind Valley office. But. I can definitely tell, like I told you, they have like meditation classes. It's very pseudoscience-y stuff, but they have some really good stuff on there. There's a lot of great courses as well, but oh it's gosh. very like wow, religious. This is crazy. It's amazing. <laughs> they got ranked one of the best offices um, ever. It's I'll, really I'll link pretty. it or something. It's, it is. So it's called the Temple of Light. So you can <laughs> definitely tell, like, I think like right now, and especially in this book, The Buddha and the Badass, he talks about it. You know, we don't have religion. So a lot of people's religion now is their workspace. So yeah. you know what? This is a great topic now that we're kind of in business side of like, 
you know, with, with remote work and COVID, how have you been able to continue like a great company culture with Growth Machine and some of the other things that you've been working on? Growth Machine has been remote since day one, so nothing changed right. for us. So it's literally nothing changed. <laughs> I thought it, was, cool. it was kind of funny for us because all of our, a lot of our friends and families and whatnot were suddenly having to adjust to remote work. And then they were like asking us questions about how to do things and whatnot. And like the, the analogy or the, the thing that I always thought was funny is that a lot of people who are suddenly switching to remote work are doing all these like funky Zoom backgrounds and like setting up their Zoom space. So they have like a cool background when they're speaking. And we're all just like, yeah, you know, showing up unshowered, like, <laughs> uh, totally. messy background, like significant others passing, whatever. Or it's like nobody cares. <laughs> it's just like you we're just used, used to it. It's like you're, you know, we're all there to do our job, not to like look pretty on Zoom. Um, and I think it was like it was actually kind of a competitive advantage in that sense because while everybody else was scrambling to figure out like what the hell do we do now, we were just like, oh, just keep working, right? So. It really wasn't much of a change at all. I think that people, I think individuals were certainly changed and affected in the sense of, you know, not being able to go outside and do things for months at a time takes a big psychological toll. But I was at least very fortunate to be in Austin where we never had a bad outbreak, where life never changed that much. Um, And, you know, today we're doing like 30 person barbecues and going to restaurants and going to bars and sitting outside and like it's basically back to normal there's like literally nothing from pre-covid that i miss now i miss like oh going into grocery stores without a mask on but that's about it it's, yeah it's the new normal now here. i feel like masks might stick around for some people because like i've been to asia and like masks are like the so widespread i, I would like yeah. to see it actually because i'm not even covid but like when someone has like a cold or like a, a regular flu i don't want people sneezing on my groceries like come on like yeah. you see people sneezing on like apples and oranges at the supermarket it sucks so yeah. i don't mind if that stays actually <laughs> It's it's going to be interesting to see how some of that shift happens because like half of mask wearing is more about signaling than about reasonable precautions. Totally. So yeah, it's like wearing, you know, if you're in a confined, if you're indoors with other people, especially in a small space, like you should absolutely be wearing a mask, right? Like we yeah. know that that's the primary like vector of transmission. But when I see people like out biking with a mask on, I'm like, what are you doing? Right? Like, they either you're, don't you're know, outdoors. they either just don't even know or they... <laughs> yeah. It's like this, at this point, you're just wearing it to signal that you... To signal something, right? Like you're, you're part of yeah. the mask wearing crowd, right? Like at some point it got politicized that there are maskers and anti-maskers. Yeah. And it's like, I live in Texas. I don't... I don't see hardly anyone going indoors not wearing masks, all right? Like, it's not that common of a thing. Um, I'm sure it is in some parts, but you definitely don't see it that much around Austin, except at the gun range. Nobody at the gun range wears a mask, but... I, <laughs> of course I not. I, of course I, I kind of like that, else. actually. It's just like... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know yeah. why. It just feels right, but... Um, yeah, there's like something that, about wearing like, a mask and holding a gun, a loaded gun. Yeah, it just doesn't feel right. <laughs> <laughs> No, just it's just the virus. Creepy. It'll be fine. That's how yeah. we solve things here. <laughs> I mean, if you saw someone like pre-COVID with a mask and a gun, you'd be a little scared. You'd, yeah, be, you'd probably be terrified. <laughs> you'd be like, what the yeah. fuck? Walking yeah. into the gun range with a cowboy hat and bandana yeah. on. <laughs> fully loaded. Well, I, w- I will tell you one thing, Nat. I'm in Canada and I can tell you when I ride my bike in Toronto, I like to wear the mask because it's fucking cold here. And the, fr- oh, well, and the mask I found, I'm like, I'm like, I don't care when COVID is over. I'm going to continue wearing this mask or at least get a net gator or something because yeah. it's so fucking cold. The wind chill. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane, man. Cool. Uh, okay. So there's a couple things I want to actually get into before uh, we head out because I know we got about half an hour here. One of the big topics is the joining the mafia. Um, so we're, let's get back into content creation here because we talked about this, something you haven't talked about yet that I think will be super interesting. It's about joining mafias and how that's sort of like a, maybe a growth tactic or maybe some... I, I'm going to leave it to you to, to, dis- to discuss it because... I don't know shit about this and this is why I'm bringing you on here to talk about it. So why don't you talk about joining mafias and, and, and uh, how that works in the content creator space and how maybe people can create their own mafias. Yeah. So I, I'd say up until this year, I pretty much did everything content related, like purely on my own. And so just on my own site uh, and, you know, through my own email list, through my own like course setup, whatnot. And that was like, a really good way to do it, but it's also limited because it 
uh, you sort of like lose some of the economies of scale. It can fracture audience across multiple platforms. You know, there, there's downsides of it too. It's also slower. Uh, so this year, I kind of shifted my mindset on that a little bit, which was, you know, it would actually be better to potentially give up some of the short term upside for greater long term upside by working with other people who are doing similar things so that we can create, in some sense, a like one stop shop for people achieving certain goals. So I joined basically two different groups this year. One is um, Tiago Forte's Forte Academy, where he teaches his building a second brain course because uh, my Rome course, Effortless Output, is like very much inspired by building a second brain. I went through BASB four years ago. Wow. And wow. uh, really got a lot of value from it, but I really hated doing it in Evernote. I found Evernote to be such a like shitty tool for what the course was trying to achieve. And so then when I discovered Rome, I was like, oh, wow, this is like the first good Basby tool. And that was what inspired making the effortless output course was like, okay, here's how you do um, knowledge management in Rome. And that's obviously done super, super well. And so I you know, contacted Tiago and I was like, hey, and Tiago and I were friends before, but I was like, hey, should that's we just cool. like put effortless output on Forte Academy? Because it's like a perfect fit for building a second brain. It can be rolled into promotions with other things. Like there's a lot of really nice overlap here and he's like yeah that's a great idea so we did it and uh that's been really nice because you know we're all incentivized to promote each other's stuff now yeah. um so you know that that was one and then the other one is uh, i joined the everything bundle uh, a couple weeks ago now which is a a Substack publication that is a bundle of other publications so it was started by um dan shipper and nathan bastias and dan has a uh a publication called Super Organizers, and uh, Nathan has one called Divinations, and they've been finding other writers about like productivity, business strategy, things like that around the web, and kind of like bringing them into their bundle to make like this super publication. And it's nice because you just pay twenty dollars a month, you get access to all of it, and you don't have to like go subscribe and pay for a bunch of different things. So. Dan's in it, Nathan's in it, Tiago's actually in it as well. So Tiago and I are like partnered in two different you know, mafia things. That's awesome. Uh, Adam Kiesling has a really great publication on like business strategy as well. Legion and Nathan Bastias do a podcast about like the creator economy. And so we're all bringing different publications into the fold. And that's been like really fun because one, we all like can feed off of each other. We're sharing ideas, bouncing things around in the Slack channel and whatnot, giving each other feedback on pieces. Uh, but also there's it's nice for me because i wanted to do a paid publication i wanted to do like a paid newsletter but i've never liked feeling obligated to my uh subscribers like i've never felt i've never as soon as i feel like i have to do something to continue receiving someone's money i don't want to do it anymore i want to like make things and leave them or i want to like do them at my own pace and so the issue i'd had with i had a patreon for the made you think podcast a couple of years ago but Neil and I killed it relatively quickly because we didn't like feeling forced to do additional stuff just to keep Patreon subscribers happy. So I knew right. I would hit a similar problem with a paid newsletter. And so instead of making one of my own, I was like, well, I could just join theirs. I'm still getting you know, a lot of the upside by bringing my readers to it. But if, one of, you know, if I have a month where I just don't want to write anything, everybody who subscribed will still be getting a lot of value from everybody else in the oh. bundle. That's right? awesome. So it's where it, there's almost a built in like uh, covering bonus yeah. to it in the sense that, you know, if, if Dan doesn't write for a week or two, the rest of us are writing. If Nathan's not writing for a week or two, the rest of us are writing. If I'm not writing, everyone else is writing. And so subscribers are always getting good content because, you know, everyone's pre vetted. And uh, it's a really good way to like make sure that subscribers are like always happy. So I've been super happy about that. Launch went super well. And they have a good way of testing people before they launch, which is uh, one, they have to make sure that your topics align, that you're a good enough writer, that you're bringing an existing audience, things like that. But then two, they want to make sure that you can write well for their audience. So they actually have you do a couple test articles on their existing publications. So uh, I did one article on super organizers about how I uh, manage my book notes in Rome. And that was like a good article, did really well. But then I had another article on Divinations, uh, Nathan's newsletter about Oatly and why I think it's a terrible product and nobody should drink it. And yeah. that, was the, that was the highest traffic day for the Everything Bundle since they started. So <laughs> it was like, 
that there was, was really controversy cool. That was in like, there, man. <laughs> yeah, that was my like test article for joining, and then I was like, oh, cool, that went super well. Um, and now Nathan and I have a running joke that he has to come onto my publication Almanac and write the most popular article on that because I like yeah. stole it from him. <laughs> it's got to so, be controversial. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, a really good way to get a lot of views is to shit on something a lot of people love. Um, yeah, which I, you know, it's it's weird. You've done because, that a couple times, man. There's one that yeah, I'm thinking of. I want to see if you're going to bring the same one up. Yeah, and uh, we're probably thinking of the same one, which is the the hustle porn uh, yeah. or struggle porn. Um, yeah. Alex Alexis Ohanian wrote a very similar article after mine that used the term hustle porn instead of struggle porn, and I'm I'm very frustrated because his terminology was better. I think that was a better term than struggle porn. But it also it also um, sounds more like a porn site or something or por- struggle porn is porn. actually a thing apparently i found that out after i wrote the article it's like yeah, so a why don't you BDSM preface thing. yeah why don't you preface that's not so that's <laughs> not what you're talking about that's not what you're no, writing no. about <laughs> well yeah so the, the first thing i was going to say is that i always feel kind of weird emotionally after one of those articles because on the one hand it always does incredibly well i've written four articles that i would put in that category the Oli article a soylent article the struggle porn article and a facebook article and every single one of those has at the time been one of the most popular things i've ever written um the facebook one in particular was like in medium like medium.com's onboarding for a long time so like if you signed up for a medium account one of the articles you got in your onboarding flow was my facebook article and medium was paying me for every view of that article so they were literally like I was getting paid for just like being in their onboarding flow, which was sick. It was one month That's where Medium so sent me like $7,000 for the amount of views Whoa. that the articles got. It was nuts. Um, but in like in all four of those cases, not so much in the Facebook one, but in the other three, there's like a, there is like a guilt and a sadness that comes with writing something like that because there is inevitably going to be like, I, I try to keep it moderate enough like obviously I'm critiquing something and I'm going to be harsh to it and I'm going to be snarky and make jokes, but I try not to be like too, I try not to be too mean. I don't want to like, right. You don't want to be overly dick. mean. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be a dick, but then other people will like get excited about it and pile on and start being mean. So in like the, in the struggle porn case, it was about like this unhealthy work culture, um, especially in startups and entrepreneurship of like, Oh, you just got to like struggle, struggle, struggle and like suffer, suffer, suffer. And then eventually it'll work. You should be doing like hundred hour weeks. And if you're awake and you're not working, then you're losing and all of this. And, you know, to me, the canonical purveyor of that philosophy is uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. Right. And it just feels like all of the content he puts out is encouraging that mentality. And, you know, I had, you know, a bunch of, examples in there and is talking about how it's like if you're believing this shit like you're making yourself unhappy and does not have to be this way um but in the article i kind of like went out of my way in the intro to say like look i'm critiquing at gary v i don't know who gary vaynerchuk actually is i assume that he is not this person all the time it's run by multiple people like for sure as well yeah there's no way it's it's like that is a personality that is a character that he plays that does very well and yeah. I think that that character is doing a disservice to entrepreneurial society. Yeah. Um, and I, I tried to like say that fairly explicitly in the intro, uh, but it sort of turned into a lot of people like being really mean to Gary, which I didn't want. And no. I like felt bad about afterwards. And he and I actually connected on Twitter afterwards and talked it out a little bit. And I, I feel like we were cool after that. But then like other people were joining in on that conversation and like they were being dicks to him. And I was like, this is like, uh, and then it's I was like, wanted, I, yeah. Yeah. I was like, do I take it down? It's like, I don't really want to take it down because a lot of people actually really love the premise of the article and it still gets shared a lot. But I went in and I like reworded a few things to make them less like mean um, and tried to like tell other people to stop being dicks about it. But I was like, I feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's a weird mix because I got so many people texting me or emailing me being like, Oh my God, that was amazing. Like, thank you for writing that. It got like incredible positive response, but then it was also all this like negative energy being put out in the world. And it's like tough because I think there are a lot of people who only write positive things and who say like, no, my Twitter is going to only be positive. Right. I don't want to like start shit and I don't want to like bring negative energy. But I think that if you do that, then you're not trustworthy because nobody's positive all the time. And if in your brand and in like your Twitter and whatnot, you're always just talking about how great things are, then nobody knows if you actually like anything, right? 
they right. assume that you're just like being this positive person and that's your character it makes you less trustworthy like you kind of have to critique things sometimes in order to be like trusted as a source right so like i do this on my book notes on my site as well it's like i've got a lot of book notes that are at five six or below including books that like are very popular to a lot of other people and i could just and like in some cases i I put that up and then i end up becoming like friends or knowing the author later and it's like oh this is kind of weird it's kind of awkward (laughs) yeah um but i like they probably haven't seen it or anything i don't know right have but like at the same time i can't go back and like hide my review of their book or change it just because now i know them because that would be like dishonest and like a really important thing to me with the online image and stuff is being perceived as somebody who is like giving his honest take on a lot of this stuff and being very low bullshit and just like this is my experience this is what i've learned this is what i like maybe know and like here's what i think about stuff i think that requires having some like critiques and having some like negativity about things uh and so same thing with the only article right and that one i didn't feel bad about at all because i actually think they are poisoning people and yeah. Do, is, that no, all, like, is that all oat milk or is it just that specific brand uh it's pretty much all oat milk i have okay. not found a single oat milk that does not fall into that category of being like mostly terrible for you <laughs> right so <laughs> it's like yeah well there's, it's, there's, sorry there's for me. i don't drink no dairy but i mean i guess go almond milk how's that i don't know i trust your opinion on it. how's how's almond milk any almond milk that you get at a cafe is going to be terrible for you. And oh, like, okay. you really shouldn't be drinking it. Yeah. Cause it's like, okay, so this is you're going to get actually you, you will know this because we can segue in this after how you know this because you started a cafe, which yeah. unfortunately I'm just had to close down. So maybe this is a really good time to segue into this. Sorry to talk over you on that last thought, but no, you're I guess it's a great time. Um, you know, talking about maybe not everything that's positive that's going on, especially with COVID and things that happen, they're kind of outside of your control. Um, you had a business that was an online business that you shifted into, uh, uh a physical store and obviously that had to close down from covid uh so maybe you can kind of talk about that and and we talked about because i had a business too that was kind of affected by covid and kind of like pivoting so i want to talk talk to you now just about pivoting during that time and how maybe it was kind of shitty but i'm sure it worked out for you in the long run <laughs> just like with the rome course and everything else that you did afterwards yeah i mean this was I, it was one of those things where it's like it sucks but there's literally nothing we could have done about it, right? Where, you know, so my wife and I started uh, an online business called Cup and Leaf. It was a tea company. Uh, we started that back in 2018. It was just like e-commerce selling like high-end tea online. Uh, and we, you know, had been growing that online. We moved to Austin at the end of 2018 and then thought like, you know, it'd be cool if we could actually expand this into a physical place because it's inexpensive enough in Austin for that to be an option. Right. So we ended up finding a spot, got the lease in like February 2019, spent the next <clears throat> 10, 11 months renovating the place to get it ready to be a cafe. So like putting in all the plumbing, the electrical, buying the appliances, building in the bar, building in the seating, figuring out the design, everything, like figuring out process, uh, just like getting all of that going. And then we were able to like open for real in January of 2020, right? So it's like, you know where the story is going. We're open for two months and then COVID shuts down, right? And it was one of those things where the whole experience was designed around being a place where you sit in for three, four hours, have like a few different teas, work on your laptop, like, uh, you know, get a pot of something, bring friends, hang out. Like it's an indoor experience. There's not many people getting like to-go tea. Um, okay. This just wasn't what we were optimizing around. And so... As soon as COVID hit, we're like, all right, we'll just do the online stuff and, you know, try to ride this out. And eventually it was like, we're probably never or not for another like six months going to be in a, or at least not until like sometime 2021 going to be in a spot where we could like open this back up and work on it. And then it was just a question of like, all right, you know, you look at all of the opportunities that you have and does it make sense to keep throwing good money after bad? Right. And I find like a very useful mental model is like, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to earn your money back where you lost it. So even if we have this lease and we're losing $3,500 a month, having to just like pay rent on a space we can't use, it doesn't mean we have to make the $3,500 back with that space. So I was doing a lot, you know, obviously I was still working on Growth Machine. Um, I was doing the Rome course, stuff on my blog. Uh, Cosette actually got her real estate license and she's doing real estate now. And it's like 
working That's with awesome. another agent here and has been doing that. And it was just like, all right, we're just gonna have to let this go and, you know, focus on other things and then hopefully find a way to like mitigate those expenses eventually. But it was just like shitty, shitty timing. And I think that there's like a big emotional component to this stuff too. Yeah. Right? Where it's like, if you spend 10, 11 months working on something, and I mean, if you go look at like the reviews on Yelp and Google, like they're all stellar. Like people were writing paragraphs of reviews on Yelp because of like what a nice experience we'd created there. Like we, we honestly did a very good job with it, but it's like, you know, what are you going to do? It's like COVID shows up and screws you. And we were just fortunate enough to be able to go work on other things instead of right. like, you know, so we have a lot of friends in the service industry now just from doing that. And I mean, all of the other like restaurant owners, cafe owners who have like no other option than to just try to figure it out and try to do the go and outdoor seating and whatnot and like barely scrape by. It's like, we're very lucky that we didn't have to do that. And I definitely feel for the people who do, you know, we've had a lot of friends or we've had a lot. We've had at least one friend had to shut down her business and cafe. Um, another one, like he figured out a really great transition into doing more e-commerce stuff while still doing his cafe. Uh, you know, we had one, there's like a, a friend who runs a wine bar in town and he like had to fight with Texas ABC for like months to get the license to serve food and alcohol. Cause basically the game now is every bar is open again. Like the, like bars aren't allowed to be open, but now every bar is a restaurant, right? Oh, so gotcha. basically what bars have done is they've figured out a food menu using like microwave ovens or whatever they can slip into their bar space and then and like parking food trucks and doing stuff like that and then they pay a lawyer a couple grand to like argue with tabc to get them a license to serve alcohol again and like this one guy it took him like two or three months longer than every other place because they were just like being dicks about it and it's like that sucks right you're just like paying rent and losing money and you don't have other businesses that you can work on it like has to come from this one thing it's like it's a really tough position to be in so it speaks to the power of like being diversified in your projects because when one completely blows up for like i mean it's literally the biggest black swan that you could have yeah. never predicted right totally it's like when we signed that lease in february of 2019 like the goal was to get it open and figure it out and that by the end of 2020 we would have you know another two or three spots like planned out that we were starting to work on right like we wanted to make it a big thing yeah we thought it was going to be like a really cool experience and then just like the whole world changed right yeah you can't do anything about that so it's like it's very sad it's still a little like emotionally triggering the whole thing but it's also helpful to remember that like a lot of good stuff came out of it too we were fortunate to be in a situation where we could do other things and also like we learned so much by doing that like yeah. we learned so much about commercial leasing, commercial real estate, plumbing, electrical, carpentry, like handiwork, negotiation, uh, like financial management, like project planning. And we've got like all these contractors that we know in Austin now where now that we're doing more real estate stuff, it's like we have people who we can contact for everything, right? That's we meet so a lot cool. of friends in the service industry and like a few of our best friends in Austin, like we met through just like connecting with the other like restaurant entrepreneurs and stuff. It's like you can get a lot of good stuff out of the bad too. And totally. the, the other mental model that I find is very helpful is one that uh, my friend Anthony uses, which is like, you're, uh, you didn't lose money, you were paying tuition. Ah, right? I love that. It's so true. Yeah. yeah. Paying to learn. Like you yeah. were just paying to learn, right? It was an expensive yeah. education because like we probably lost over a hundred grand on the whole cafe thing, but it's like you learn a ton you at made, the very least. You made way more than that. Like you said, making your money elsewhere, you made way more than that with the course, which I don't think you would have been able to do if you kind of, if you didn't, well, I guess if you were focusing more on the cafe, or do you think you still would have done the course, the Rome course? Uh, I actually did the Rome course while in the cafe. Oh, shit. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Okay, so there you go. So this, this, this reinforces the idea of multiple um, projects, diversifying your income and your projects, because... I think there's this another uh, sinister mindset or mental model going around, which is like, you need to niche down. You need to be known for one thing. You got to do one thing where I've been thinking like, okay, hey, something's up with that. I don't think that's true. And then seeing people like you online that like you've been doing so much and you've made it so synergistic. And I don't know if that's a word, but it's so much synergy between all your projects and making it work and feed into one another. And you've just been like, 
growing by doing multiple things. So it's been, it's been really awesome to see you do that. And it's really inspiring for me, man. Like really, really inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the one caveat I would give to that is like, you can do a bunch of different stuff, but they should all feed together in some way. So I think that like, you know, perhaps one mistake with the cafe was that it really didn't feed off of anything else I was doing. So it was really starting from zero, right? There was no, there wasn't much way I could leverage like my site or my newsletter or anything to like make the cafe work. Uh, We would occasionally get like a visitor who was on my newsletter, which was actually super cool because I got to meet like some neat people who had read the stuff and they're like, yeah, we wanted to come check it out. And it's like, that's awesome. But for the most part, it was like starting from zero. I, all of my other projects now, I try to make a growth out of something else I'm already doing. So like the stuff we were talking about with YouTube before is a perfect example where like I started my, you know, I started doing YouTube a month and a half ago and it's gone from like three and a half to five and a half thousand subscribers. But like I already had three and a half just from doing a few like random ass videos over the last five years. And I've been able to use like my email newsletter and my Twitter following to like accelerate that growth. Right. So it, it feeds off of the other stuff I'm doing and it feeds back into them. Where like YouTube supports the blog and the newsletter and the podcast and everything else. Like it's I think creating like virtuous systems that are mutually beneficial is like really powerful. Doing a lot of completely disconnected things, that's not necessarily a good idea. Right. Like I'm trying to think what a good example of this would be. Like actually, okay, here's a good one. Um there's a guy that I met, he's actually a banker at Chase and super interesting dude. And he was helping me like set up some bank account stuff. And we just got to talking because he was interested in like all my entrepreneurial stuff. And he, what he told me is that his side hustle is he buys um, like uh, large delivery trucks that are on the borderline of when you need a CDL and when you don't. So you can just drive them with a regular driver's license. And then he hires drivers on Craigslist to drive the trucks to fulfill last mile deliveries for large local businesses. So his main client was Best Buy. So Best Buy would send him a dossier of deliveries in the morning. He would accept it. He would send it to his driver. His driver would pick up the truck, go to Best Buy, pick up all the stuff and drop it all off. And he said he was netting $10,000 a month per truck. Whoa. So... You, you get enough cash to like buy one of these trucks, you find a driver, you find a way to get the deals for the deliveries, and then it's just like a cash machine, right? Totally. It's like he's making, he might have been making more money doing that than he was in his job at Chase, and he was just waiting to make enough money total to like go do that full time. And right. as soon as I heard that, I was like, that is fucking awesome. I love that. I want to look into this right now. And Honestly. I still kind of want to look into it because it's so cool. But it doesn't tie into anything else that I do, right? Like, right. how do I leverage my site into like, you know, last mile delivery service, right? Like it doesn't, it doesn't connect. And so as tempting as that is, as like a cash grab in a project, it's not a good use of my energy because I can't leverage all the existing assets to do a really good job there. And that's sort of what I try to think about more now is like, I mean, compounding interest is, you know, I don't know if it's Einstein or whoever, but it's like, it's the most powerful force in the universe, right? If yeah, you can I think compound it was, on yeah. something for long enough, you get incredible results. So if you keep restarting at zero, you never get compounding. But if you can find something to compound, then you get incredible returns. And I think like, for lack of a better term, the best thing that I have to compound on is just like my brand, right? And like my influence or what? It's like, I hate all these terms, right? Like they feel like yeah, yucky. Yeah, but yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like doing the last mile delivery thing might be a great way to generate cash, but it doesn't do that, right? Maybe it, it could be a good blog post, a good story, right? Like that might be one way to hack it, like a YouTube series or yeah. something. Um, but even that's a good example of taking something seemingly unrelated and making it related to like the thing that you are trying to compound. So I find having that is a really good way to balance the desire to do a ton of disparate things is like, all right, what is the thing that you want to compound on? And does this new thing facilitate that or not? Man, I love that. That's such a great mental model. It really helps me because I'm always thinking about like all these other projects. Like I've notoriously started a couple side projects, which this podcast was one of them. But now I'm just thinking, you know, if I want to compound something, it's going to be personal brand, like you said, because whatever it is that you connect yourself to, it's going to be connected and you'll be able to grow. And one of my questions for you was actually going to be, what is the one of your best investments you've made? But I think you've answered that, which is just putting it into your, your personal brand. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, starting my site back in college, I think was probably one of the smartest things I ever did. It's like, and it was, it, it was kind of, I don't know, like, 
I don't remember being embarrassed, but it was there was like a little bit of embarrassment involved in it in the sense that like all of my, you know, I was in this like very serious professional business fraternity and all of my other peers were like going off to jobs at, you know, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and McKinsey and Bain or whatever. Um, I don't know if anyone went to Bain, but like you know, other consulting firms and like going to Google and Facebook and like everyone's got these like badass high prestige jobs. And I'm like, I'm going to start a blog. Right. And there was definitely this element of like, yeah, I could tell that there were a lot of people who were like, what the fuck is Nat doing? Right. Like, like, how is he making money? Like, is he making money? Like, are his parents supporting him? Right. Like, right. What's, yeah. what's he doing? Uh, and that was like, you know, again, I think I was just like very cocky. And so it didn't bother me, but it was sort of like, a brave and courageous are not the right terms to use, but it was like a non-conventional decision to make. I'd say that's and, courageous. And it, it certainly sure. wasn't like, I certainly did not have support from my community to do it. I think that's the best way to put it. Huh. So uh, I was very, I mean, I'm very happy now that I did that because it's like, you know, I definitely did not have the same like financial success out of the gate that a lot of other people had going down those traditional routes. But it's like compounding on that for long enough has, you know, paid back like incredible dividends. So I'm just like very happy that I decided to be like that. Eh, you know what? Like, I'm not going to do that safer thing and it's going to pay off eventually. And like, you know, I think this year especially has just been the biggest uh, example of that with like growth machines, growth, my site's growth with doing the Rome stuff, like all of it, it felt like it turned over in a certain way this year. Uh, and that's been like a really good feeling. So that's awesome. It was been cool to see you kind of grow over the years. Like I said, I was one of the early readers on your blog and stuff a couple of years ago. So it's cool to see you kind of grow. And I've noticed that growth. So it's really awesome to, to see. And like, like I said, it's inspiring for me. Like I just started this podcast this year, which I think will start feeding into my transmedia. Um, maybe we can start using that as a mental model, the transmedia strategy. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of different things. So it's been really cool to see you do that. It's been really inspiring. So one of the last things I kind of want to, to end on is sort of how, A, how you manage this all and how you manage all your projects. I mean, you, you don't have to go too deep in the woods because I'm sure you, uh, you might do a blog post. Or you have something else already up on how you kind of manage some of this stuff. Um, maybe some of the tools, some of the strategies. And you, all, you obviously have a team. And then maybe we can fulfill on the promise at the beginning of talking about your VA. <laughs> So let's yeah. get into the management of all this and how you make it all work. How do I manage all of this poorly? <laughs> it's probably the right way to describe it. I'm, That's how it always feels, I'm, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm a very like I'm a lifelong procrastinator. I do everything at the last minute whenever possible. Uh, I need pretty extensive systems in place to stay on top of things, but uh, I haven't I haven't really clarified this thought yet, so it's not going to sound cohesive, but. On some level, I believe that if you need a task manager to get a project done, it is not a project that truly resonates with you. So like a, a task manager is in some ways a way of like beating yourself into submission to the work that you don't inherently want to do. And what I've been thinking about more is how do I do work that naturally carries itself where I don't need to be <clears throat> opening a sauna every day and saying, what do I need to get done today? Or rather, like, what am I assigned today? Because even if you're setting your own tasks, if you wake up and you just have like a list of tasks to get through, you're still kind of like working a job. It's just like a job for yourself. And so I've been trying to find a balance between not overly structuring things to allow myself to be creative while having enough structure to not let things fall through the cracks. And I think I... I, I flow back and forth between those two mediums fairly often where I'll be like in a more creative mode where a lot of other stuff falls through the cracks and then I'll be in a more manager mode but where I'm like less creative and I'm trying to think of how I can even structure my days or weeks to facilitate that flow more strategically versus letting it happen by accident like it does now. Um, and Amanda's been an incredible like person to work with because in, in all of the ways that I am weak, she is very strong. Like she's very, very good at staying on top of things, at being organized, at responding to stuff very quickly, at uh, anticipating other people's needs. Like it, it's literally all of the like worst parts of my work personality are like the best parts of hers. And so cool. I've always had this like, you know, 
If you had tried to schedule this interview with me like three months ago before she and I were working together, it probably would have taken like three weeks because I would have been like, yeah, let's do it. Shoot me an email. And then you'd shoot me an email and I wouldn't respond to it for like a week because even though it would take me two minutes to respond to it, I don't know what it is, but I'm just like, oh, like get to it later, right? Like it's, it's not yeah. urgent. I can respond to that email later. And then like it's just in the inbox for forever. And it's like even simple things like what you <clears throat> alluded to where I was like, hey, yeah, <clears throat> let's do it. Email Amanda. Here's her email. Like, tell her I sent you from Twitter, and she'll get it booked. And then we were like, booked and good. It's like that. It's it's like that's something that I've never been good at, which sounds stupid, but it's like I'm notoriously terrible at responding to anything because I just want to like work on the stuff I'm excited about, uh, and I want to like play with new tools. And like, it, like the Growth Machine team basically had to ban me from introducing new tools because I always want to like. <laughs> I like find a new tool and I get excited. I was like, guys, we should like use this. It's going to be so much better for editorial. And at one point, oh my God. our COO Nora had to be like, Nat, like no more tools. Like you're just Dude, not allowed that's, to. That's literally change me. Our oh my God. <laughs> I so, was like, all right, fair. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I so, feel that 100%. And now at this time, there's so many fucking tools coming out. And you're like, this is better. This is yeah. awesome. So that's, that's interesting to hear. It's not just so me. I, I think. Fuck. I. I and this kind of goes back to the article I was previewing for you earlier about like you're a stupid monkey and or I'm a stupid monkey and you are too. It's like I know I'm really bad at like most things. Mm-hmm. So hiring people who are very good at those things and letting them do the things they are great at and I'll do the things that I'm great at and then together we can like build good businesses and lifestyles and everything for each other. It's like that's the actual ideal. I really, you know, I used to think that you should like, you know, force yourself into being good at all these things that you're not and like you know you shouldn't you shouldn't like give up on these you know certain things for some of it that's true right like if you're overweight you should lose weight get healthy but if for you're sure. like a bad responder you should have somebody helping respond to things if you're a bad like project manager you should have somebody managing your projects for you right if you're a bad uh if you're a bad writer like let somebody else do the writing and you focus on something else right like we have to tell this to our clients at Growth Machine all the time. It's like you are probably not the best person to write the content for your company's blog because you're probably not a professional writer, right? Like, right. Hire a writer. Uh, and so I think just like doing doing well enough at the area where you are great, so you can afford to hire at least one person who can help cover the areas where you are not, is the most powerful way to like significantly accelerate your success in like any field. And the only reason I'm able to do a bunch of different projects is because there are other people who are working on them with me who, you know, probably don't get as much like face time and credit as they deserve. And so that's why I try to like use their names a lot and mention that they're actually the ones doing most of this stuff, right? It's like cool. everybody on the growth machine team and Amanda and Michael on the YouTube stuff. It's like, we're all working on this together. It's not like me, some superhuman doing a ton of stuff. Like I'm not, I'm like good at a couple things. And then I just like find great people to work with. That's like really how you manage a lot of stuff at scale. That's a really good point because a lot of people do see, again, like people like yourself, like just like pumping out content. Some of these YouTubers that do like three YouTubers and podcasters that are doing like three videos or three, four episodes a week. And you're like, how the fuck do they do that? It's like, well, they don't, they have a team. So it's all about delegation, I guess, at that point. Right. So I'm still at the point where I'm doing this myself and fuck man, like even just this podcast is a lot of work. So I'm already thinking about how can I hire editors and people to like manage things. But it's interesting to me that you got someone for more of the admin stuff. So from Amanda, how did you find her and how did, like, is she based in the US? Is she based like elsewhere? How did you um, find her and how did you get to work with her? Yeah. So uh, I'll do quick because I, I do have to hop into a meeting in a minute here, but I, uh, there's, there's this really great service called great assistant or great assistance. I think it's like great dash assistant or great dash assistance.com. Um, you can also use nataliason.com slash great assistant, but nice. <laughs> uh, no, so they, they're incredible. It's like a one-time flat fee. They do the entire hiring process for you. So they work with you to like create the job listing. They put it up where they know they're going to get good applicants. They interview everyone for you. They give you two people who they think are really qualified and then you interview them. And cool. in like 9% plus of cases, one of those two is going to be an awesome fit for you. If not, they'll keep looking. But yeah, one of those first two they sent me was Amanda. We started working together. They help with the onboarding, the training, setting up SOPs. They give everybody they help hire like a library of SOPs and resources on how to do things. Cool. Plus they add them to a Facebook group with other VAs of entrepreneurs. So they can like ask each other questions and stuff about how to do things. It's smart. It's honestly one of the best services I've ever worked with. 
because it's like I have tried and failed to hire a really great virtual assistant type role for three years and it's never worked. And they just like fucking nailed it. And Amanda and I love wow. working together. Um, we've like been able to do so much stuff together since she started a few months ago. And now it's at the point where I just like literally cannot imagine doing most of the stuff that I'm doing if like she weren't helping with it. So it's dude, that is very awesome. worth working with them. Yeah. Cool. And I've heard the same out. testimonial from like five other of my friends. That's why I worked with them. Because I like I know uh, Tiago Forte and David Perel, they both worked with them. Um, Austin Bronner from e-commerce influence, he worked with them. It's like there's a lot of people who have used their service and they just fucking crush it. So that's awesome. Cool. So it's highly recommended. I'll check that out. And I'd love to see maybe if you're thinking about putting a post on how you work with her, that'd be also cool from your perspective. Like two weeks. Perfect. Yeah. So I'll link that when it's <laughs> out. So before you get going, because I know you got to hop off. So I have one question that I love to end off these uh, podcasts with, which is just, I like to put it on a high note. What is something you're super excited about coming up in the future? YouTube, man. We're going to get to grow this YouTube channel. We're going to hit some good subscriber number. We're going to add it as a service at Growth Machine. We're going to help other people grow their channels. It's like, I'm very, very bullish on it. And it's fun for me. I like doing it. And I like having the, I like having that beginner's mind again. And I like having no, no pressure or no stakes. I feel a lot of pressure when I write an article. Because I, I feel like I have this image of a good writer, or like a blogger or whatever. So I feel like it needs to be good. But with the YouTube stuff, it's like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. So if I want to do like a stupid thumbnail with me, like with a superhero text and whatever, or, you know, doing some like something silly, like I can do it. And I don't feel embarrassed or like I'm, you know, messing up anything by doing it. It's just like it's pure experimentation, which is really, really fun to be doing. So that's awesome. And I hope you can carry that through that. like oh, over a long, long term because it's hard to, to keep that mindset even with the writing, right? You kind of get into a different yeah. stage. So hopefully you can keep that. I'm super excited for all the videos you have coming out. And uh, Nat, thanks so much for taking the time to be on this podcast. Hopefully we can do it again because I think there's just so much like just the nature of both of our um, interests. There's so many different things there. So hopefully we can do this again because it was an absolute pleasure to talk to you, man. Definitely. Thanks, Josh. And uh, we'll talk more soon. Awesome. Take care.